Welcome to the Safety Share, a webinar series brought to you by CIM Magazine and the CIM Health and Safety Society. I am your organizer, Michelle Beacom, Managing Editor of CIM Magazine. Today's season finale topic is CIM HSS Initiatives to Prevent Fatalities and Serious Injuries in Our Industry. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you uh, joined by computer, please make sure that you've selected the computer audio button. If you joined by phone, please make sure you've selected the phone button. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the GoToWebinar control panel question box. Uh, note that we will have some poll questions during the presentation, so please pay attention. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are excited to be partnering with the Health and Safety Society to be able to bring this series to you. And now I'm going to introduce you to Nelson, our host. Nelson, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm going to tell, you, tell them who you are. <laughs> Nelson is treasurer for CIM's Health and Safety Society and vice president of Health and Safety at Torx Gold Resources. Welcome, Nelson. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks to everybody who's attending today. Um, this will be our last episode for the season. Um, and in today's episode, of the Safety Share, our panel will be discussing how Canadian miners can leverage what the CIM, Health and Safety Society, or HSS as I like to call it, is up to in order to improve health and safety performance in our mines and processing plants. Our guest speakers today are Samantha Espley, who serves as an independent board member for Paramount Gold, Nevada Corporation, and, Canadian, and the Canadian Academy of Engineering as a senior executive advisor. Uh, she's also a senior executive advisor of Stantec, and was past president of CIM and is currently the chair of the Health and Safety Society. Joining Samantha today is Brian Wilson, a Canadian registered safety professional who leads the WSP Canadian Mining EHS business and is member of the Ontario Mining Association Workers Compensation and Occupational Health Committee, an active member of the PDAC Health and Safety Committee, and he's also the executive committee uh, on the executive committee for the HSS as the vice chair. So today we're gonna to have a short conversation about where we started, where we're at and where we're going. And really I wanted to open the conversation, uh, Samantha, maybe we'll start with you on, on where the major achievements of the, the HSS throughout 2023. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll start talking about the future in a moment, but let's start there with what we accomplished this year because it's been a pretty big year for the society. Thanks, Nelson. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I want to thank you for hosting Nelson and suggesting the Health and Safety Society to be featured as we're closing out 2023 because it's it's a it's a new society um, and we've been ramping up uh, in 2023. And in fact, if I just go back a little bit in time, uh, health and safety within the CIM was always part and parcel of all of the societies uh, that CIM has. And um, at one point, I think it was Michael Winship, he suggested uh, splitting out and having health and safety as its own theme, its own society. And, and so by 2020, under leadership of Roy Slack, we were able to, to get the approval of council to create a health and safety society. So here we are uh, a few years later. And I remember actually when we, when we started this uh, society, I think we had eight or six or eight members. <laughs> and so, you know, we've rapidly grown over that time and 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 I think it just shows um, people's commitment and interest in health and safety in the Canadian mining industry space um, and you know so when I when I think about what we achieved in 2023 sort of looking through the lens of technical financial social uh, I, I can give you just a quick update there. So technically, or if you'd like on an admin side of things, as a society within you know, CIM's framework, uh, we needed to put together our governance, our systems and our structures in place. And so we, uh, we did a lot of work actually on uh, strategy as, as an opening um, workshop to get our team rolling and then being aligned to the CIM strategy that had been done actually when, when I was in role as president. So we, we, we hit the ground running at that point. And this year, I'm pretty excited. We wrote our charter. <laughs> Maybe it won't be exciting for other uh, listeners on the call, but we wrote a charter and it was approved by the council this year uh, unanimously and, and was actually uh, lauded as uh, a quite, quite a showpiece for other societies to mimic. 
Um, and we also we also did a lot of work on our membership um, and on our executive in particular. We uh, we put a lot of thought into who uh, we wanted to have on our executive because we wanted more of a a diverse uh, representation of members um, on that executive geographically different segments of the industry um, surface underground uh, commodity commodity different commodities and also um, the processing side of the business and you know so we have 15 executives on the health and safety society I would say um, we've got probably six of us um, myself brian daryl mcintyre john treen mark Mark Moray and John Doyle, who represent supply service sector. Um, we have a number who are from industry, like yourself, Nelson, from Torex. And we've also got um, uh, Valet, Stacey Kennedy, um, Jason Belanger, Nutrien, Kevin Watson, Agnico Eagle, and then two uh, from the con contractor construction side, that's uh, Shannon Campbell and Royce Slack. And then sort of rounding out our executive, we, we also have academic uh, research representatives. So we have Glenn Lyle from Morocco and Gord Winkle from the University of Alberta. So, you know, really um, a really diverse team and i um, really happy that we were able to achieve that this year. I, I, I'm just, um, I'm just going to say to it we we had our first annual general meeting this year in may in montreal and 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 we had a very structured meeting i'm really happy about that putting together uh, a lot of our governance and minutes and meetings um, quorum of meetings all that roberts rules um, business that zara anderson anderson actually uh, leads she's she's our secretary uh, for the executive and um working on our nomination. So we, one of our goals, not only in working on health and safety, um, technically and, and solutions and behaviors, risk assessments, all those types of systems and tools for the industry, but also working on celebrating, celebrating safety excellence. And so part of our role uh, as a health and safety society is to help to, to nominate, oversee and support safety awards um, for the Canadian industry. And so that's the JT Ryan Awards, which Gord Winkle uh, has a hand in, and then also Hatch Safety Award and the CIM Safety Leadership Award. So this year we're, we're gonna be back into it again and looking forward to the nominations for the May Vancouver event. Um, and we, you know, we're really thrilled. We have Don McLean, who is 2023 winner, who will be on our, our panel, um, yourself, Nelson, myself, Mark Moran and Gord Winkle will be uh, judges for that. And then I'm just gonna touch on financial for a minute. And you know, Nelson with yourself as treasurer, um, really starting to to put together our accounts and understanding how much uh, funds we have as a society that's being managed by the CIM central office and uh, doing a great job on, in sort of in kind for us. Um, really trying to figure out how um, we're gonna use those funds to help um, I guess promote and benefit health and safety for the mining industry. So I think that's some of the what's to come. But I, maybe just um, uh, pause right there, and maybe maybe Brian, if you don't mind, Brian, um, our co-chair, just to to step in if that's okay, and just talk about some of the some of the other things that we were able to achieve this year. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sam. That was a great uh, great summary on on where we've been over the the past few years and um, you know thinking about some of our accomplishments in 2023 uh, I really think um, you know one of the highlights actually Nelton, Nelson just to, you know kind of send some kudos your way is this webinar series the safety share this has been a, a really big success we've had tons of great feedback on it we've had some great speakers come uh, and this is kind of an example of you know um, the society's work where we've got this expanded executive we've got a lot more people now Samantha mentioned I think we're up to 15 people on the executive that are leading various different committees and by getting that extra you know bandwidth and volunteers we're able to accomplish a lot more um, and so this this webinar series is a great great example of that so thank you for for leading this Nelson um, in addition to that, um, we've got our, our quarterly newsletter, the Safety Lines, that uh, Roy Slack puts a lot of work into. So, Roy, thank you for that. Um, and then, you know, uh, our convention, you know, each year, I think for the past probably six years, even when we were just a safety committee before becoming a society, uh, convention has always been um, a big piece of the work that we do in putting together three days of 
content on mining health and safety. Um, you know, we, we put together a health and safety stream there. Uh, Glenn Lyle has been um, leading that, uh, I think, basically since its initiation, um, mm -hmm. finding people to come and present and do meaningful talks. So, um, you know, there, those are a few of the things. We've, we've done a lot more, and I'll save some for later in the discussion, but I think those are, those are a few of the, the key highlights um, that we've accomplished so far this year. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'll just uh, bounce off what I heard for you folks. Before we jump into our first poll, we're going to get the audience engaged early today. Um, you know, I'm hearing, I know the two of you have been involved since day one as we've been, you know, transitioned from that committee to the society. And as a new society, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later in the call, but we're always looking to grow members, right? So part of it is generating some, some useful content. Uh, and I do get a lot of, uh, oh, thanks for doing the, the webinar, but I got to say it's all self-serving, right? I take everything I learn in each webinar and apply it uh, in, my, in my day job. So it's pretty helpful, especially being an electrical engineer by trade in the safety side of the business right now. So it's, uh, you know, so thanks for the compliment, but, uh, but it's, it's very selfish for me to be here to, to, to learn from the best in the industry. And I guess I'll turn it over to the folks uh, on the call right now that are here. Um, for the first poll question, if we're ready with that, Michelle. And so what would you like to see the HSS focus on uh, with respect to its content offerings in 2024? There's a couple of options there. Um, we've got multiple fronts going on um, in the, you know, within the society. Uh, and of course, we're brand new. So we're interested in hearing from the members and seeing what we can, what we can pull from these, these uh, webinars and, and apply. We're about 40, 40, 50 percent voted. I'll give it a couple more seconds here before I call it. All right, Michelle, we're over 80. Let's do it. How do those results look. So I don't know if anybody's surprised there, right? The, the transforming HS culture, that's such an esoteric thing. Um, and then the training and education followed closely by mental health and well-being, um, along with the other two, pretty balanced response there, but uh, but overall the culture and the programs, right? That's I think that's where, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next, you know, what are the things to come and what are we looking at um, for the industry? So that's you know, 36, 20, 36%, 28% is pretty, evenly matched. Any commentary on that, uh, Brian or Samantha? I'm I'm not I'm Go not surprised. Time, I, yes. <laughs> I I think uh, I think that it, it's exactly where where I feel uh, health and safety society can can add a lot of value to. Because listen, like we're you're a CIM member, you're, you, you know, you can pick the Health and Safety Society and be part of our, our community um, looking at the health and safety aspects. And, and for me, I, you know, I really feel that we need to talk about culture. Um, and, and in my understanding or definition of culture is just having common beliefs, right, that we share um, at this place in time. And um, what, you know, what would be interesting to me is if, um, if, if you think back, even I don't know, five, 10 years, if any of you have been around longer than that, and I have. <laughs> so I had a really early meeting for me um, with some senior leaders on safety, and we talked about uh, the notion of zero harm. And it was new at the time, you know, zero harm, and you know, who believes it's possible? And it was sort of like maybe one, two people had their hand up. And, you know, people are like, what do you mean zero harm? It was a, a lot of um, good came out of those conversations right so and and to again back to culture like what is it what is there a harm how do we make that happen um, what are all the pieces that that fit in in terms of uh, behaviors in uh, systems organizational design all of those um all of those uh, pieces that come into play um and then uh, and allow us to build a culture um if you like a common belief of what's possible when it comes to health and safety anyway that's that's my you know off the top of my head uh, feelings on that poll Brian, any thoughts yeah, I guess, um, you know, to kind of speak to the training and education part of that response, I think, um, 
and I'm going to link it to a specific topic. Um, there's been a lot of focus on serious injury and fatality prevention. Um, and especially on that topic, I think, you know, the concept, the words are familiar, but the application um, has really been lacking. And that's what we hear even from a lot of the members of our executive, you know, like uh, we, we, we hear about it, we've seen it applied one way, maybe applied it a different way. Um, so one of the things that we will be doing or trying to do this year um, at CIM Connect, which is the, the rebranding for a convention that's gonna happen in Vancouver, is um, Glenn's trying to get in um, a half day short course on, on critical controls. And uh, this is kind of building on something we did last time we were in Vancouver, where you know we brought together a lot of industry leaders. We had five speakers come in, we ran a full day workshop on critical controls and it was actually really evident during that where we had some experts in the room like clearly there's a lot of different approaches um and and it's it's a topic that people are are struggling with so uh i'm really excited to see what sort of uh training uh glenn and, and the team that he's got coming to uh cim connect this year can can help us with yeah, it's an interesting um, challenge that our industry has, right? Because every chart that I've looked at over the last year and a half shows like a lost time injury frequency and total recordable injury frequency dropping. And then the bigger companies and, and smaller ones too, but mostly, you know, we've got these multiple sites. We talk about culture. There's probably subcultures at every school. Not probably. There's subcultures at every site, right? And within the site. But you end up with um, that spike of fatalities, right? Or you get an LTI that's like a serious injury and so we've 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 done a really good job as an industry of of eliminating a lot of the the big ones more regularly but now they're infrequent and it's that that uh that value add from a CIM perspective is I know folks are at least in at least folks I've talked with in the industry over the last year so they're looking for that kind of won't say magic bullet but where do they go to get the information they need to help prevent those and overcome those fatalities or serious injuries you get the near misses that that people report on um but that's become like the main theme at least in my day-to-day -day world is that's become the focus now right um and so what challenges uh, i guess I'll, I'll flip back to the hss so if the hss is going to provide content and training and you know guidance on culture or standards if you will what challenges does the HSS aim to help the industry overcome more specifically, right? We've talked a couple of broad broad strokes there and, and focused in on the, the SIF topic. But anything, I'll, I'll go back to Brian on that one since you're fresh off of uh, talking. Yeah, yeah well, I, I think that's um, a good segue. I mean, uh, another one of the initiatives, um, as you know, Nelson, because you're heavily involved in leading it, is, is getting this database of significant injuries and fatalities from across Canada so that we can learn about it. Um, you know, what's causing them? What are the shortcomings that are happening in our systems? Where are the gaps, right? And, you know, in the, in the US, they, they have a really good system through MSHA where, you know, all fatalities are reported into a central body, but just the way our health and safety legislation in Canada is broken up by province and territory, we don't have this nice, um, consistent framework um, so getting the the shared learnings from all the different uh, companies you know what we're hoping as CIM and specifically as the health and safety society is we're hoping we can bridge some of these gaps we can get companies to participate work with some of the regulators and and get a consistent data set um, for the Canadian mining industry so we can start learning from um, you know these unfortunate events that that have occurred in the past so and just jump on that, on that Ryan. Or other yeah for sure i i think so too and i did you know i think we do have pockets of excellence across canada with some of the the mining companies who do transparently share you know I, I'm, I'm thinking in particular like tech right so uh, even reenactment and sharing what happened um, so that you can you can understand clearly what went wrong um, and and this is all human factors right like what decisions what happened what uh, you know what tools what failed 
and and how do uh, others use that and apply that in their own operation. So I think you know to to Brian's point, having uh, that openness, that transparent, not just the data, <laughs> but understanding when these events happen, happen it would be, um, you know, transformational, I think, for our industry. And and back to the U.S., yes, they have, you know, tremendous. I know for myself, when I'm doing some designs um, for, for a client uh, with my role at Stantec, um, just going into the U.S. and looking at some of their data to understand where their risks were, what happened, and how you engineer it out, you know, in, at the engineering phase uh, for, for um, this one topsail design that we were doing. And, you know, that is hugely important um, for for even you know, service providers like us, let alone for the, the mining operators themselves. So I, I just think that it, it's a huge opportunity for us um, to understand um, and share those those learnings. I'll just add one other thing that happened this year, 20. 23, I, I had a, a colleague uh, who had a near miss in, in one of the underground mines in, in uh, I think it was in Manitoba. Anyway, he, he wanted it to remain anonymous and we, we, we did keep it that way. But it, you know, it really shook me uh, to read his story. He, he, he very much personalized a near miss underground in a, in a draw point. And uh, he called it the empty chair, and you know, and I asked him why, you know, why the empty chair, and he said because the impact's my family, you know, it's my my wife, my kids sitting at home, and there's an empty chair at the table where I would have been sitting um, if I had been killed underground today. And so it was, you know, I think that type of courage in sharing um, that this society enables, and. Um, yeah, I just think the more we do of that, the more we learn, we understand where the gaps are. Because, again, you know, I think there is a little bit of a, oh, I'm not going to say a retribution, but, it, you know, there is a bit of a culture there where you don't want to report, say, a near miss because you don't want, you know, peer pressure from your team. It could be even incentivized, right? Like, there are, there are a myriad of reasons and and those need to be put on the table and we need to talk about it and see how how we get that information forward and what we do with it like how we can make use of it and make it i don't know celebrated i guess as an industry uh, to celebrate where we had failures learn from them and then um, put put uh, controls in place to prevent those yeah I, anyway yeah, I, I, I feel pretty I, passionately about that <laughs> so i recall that story i get chills thinking about because i remember reading it going wow that, that hits home real hard right when you start thinking about that empty chair and uh yeah. i know that when we when we talk about preventing fatalities everybody wants everybody wants to look at the fatality and, and every time there is a fatality there's a multiple fatality in south africa a few weeks back right and everybody's what what were wrong can you believe that they did this and everybody's looking who do you blame for it because people die and it's it's horrible it's a tragedy but that's where this uh this sift database and and marrying it up with some standards that already exist and i know that a couple of people have said it's going to be like pushing rope up a hill but my dad always said nothing worth doing was ever easy right so um anyway so i'm looking forward to the challenges that'll bring and and thanks for highlighting some of those from your perspectives as the as the leaders of the hss so I guess that's that brings me to the next one we talked about that story there and the and people sharing like specific anecdotal stories on on what they what they've experienced. How do you believe the social aspects of our workplace are changing? And you know what should our team leaders, team members it doesn't really matter where you sit on the hierarchy, but across the industry um, we're focused. How do we keep those folks focused each day on how do we improve health and safety? to result in that zero harm uh, result, right? So from a perspective of what the HSS can bring to the table, how do you how do you view like the HSS supporting that culture building? I'll, I'll go to Samantha on this one to start. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, you know, uh, Nelson, the social side is is so interesting to me and, and essential for health and safety performance. You know, you're looking to get increased hours without injury, without, you know, without harm. You want to keep uh, keep that that metric moving. And just talking to a senior executive actually on Monday, um, it just it brought this social side to me like it's so so clear in my head because he was talking about you know doing a risk assessment and 
how do you know, like socially, you know, has it been well thought out? Like where, how is your organization structured? What are the levels? Who are the different departments? Who gets involved? Um, who are making those um, risk assessment, uh, making those judgments and, and putting controls in place? And have you got the right people? And so it, it really is social, isn't it? Um, how you design and set up your organization, your systems, uh, to properly assess risk and with clear accountabilities and expectations. And, you know, he talked about requisite organization and it, it really resonated with me. Like, do you, you know, are you going to ask a supervisor, um, no offense to any supervisor, to make a judgment about whether or not to drive a development heading through a pillar, for example? And you know, probably not, right? Like you would probably want to get a, a rock engineer, somebody who's done some design work on that to, to make that call, you know, is it high risk or isn't it? And, the, you know, that's the type of um, example that I would give with, that is very social is making sure those communication lines, that understanding of the the uh, organizational structure and, and levels of work and, and levels of accountability are really clear um, and, and working on behaviors. Um, to build teams, to build trust, to build, a, a, you know, a caring. So he really talked, you know, this executive talked about caring, a caring culture. If you have a caring culture, you're not just caring about your employees. Your empl uh, you care about the families, the communities, you know, people that that uh, that are involved in the mining industry uh, uh, peripherally, but they're still very much there. And is that a safety element? Uh, it is, right? When you think about it, it's a social element, but it's highly uh, linked to safety performance in the operations. It, it it not only helps safety, but it you know att att attraction retention of employees. You're an advocate for a company, and and it it, it transcends into production. You know, so if you have caring um, and you're you're engaging with your employees you are likely to to get great better solutions safer solutions and you're probably gonna also have a better business as a result of it right so he talked about safety as an imperative and I, I believe it is and it it is strongly multifaceted social issue um, and and very much fundamental um, for health and safety and I and again back to where does CIM health and safety society fit in well we're a community of like-minded advocates and and we would work together and talk through these so we do have a conference coming up next October I'll just put a plug in it for it and um, we will be talking about these very issues um, at that conference and and the social side of health and safety and what we need to do as organizations to to help improve the performance and i'll just i'll just um hold there nelson yeah it's interesting uh, i always re am reminded when i walk out in the field whether you're in a plant or in a mine above ground underground at a tailings tailings facility whatever and how it's easy to forget how social we are as human beings when you're caught up in the machine, right? When you're in the middle of it all. So the energy sources are just so big in our industry and and, uh, and the risks are there, but all manageable. Brian, your thoughts on that before we move to the next poll question? Yeah, I think I'll just jump in, um, going back to kind of that, um, you know, the, the health side of things that, that relate to social, um, occupational health, um, you know workplace diseases rather than injuries so that's an area that you know it's been getting a little bit more attention these days but it, it is it's a significant area um where there's lots of work needed to be done um you know icmm's recognize that they, they put a lot of uh initiatives in place for their member companies to reduce occupational exposure so i think um through our committee or through the society and our executive committee, we're looking at ways to also align, you know, maybe some of the best practice documents we're thinking about for the future to be able to address that. Uh, also, you know, overall wellness and mental health. I mean, these have been huge topics um, lately. They're definitely going to be, you know, they were on, um, they were on our agenda at last, um, at the last uh, convention. Uh, they'll definitely be on the agenda again at um, at uh, CIM Connect and also our our conference in Toronto for the Health and Safety Society uh, coming up in October. So I think you know, um, with these topics being they're they're discussed a lot more, um, they're talked about a lot more, but they're not they're usually not built into our health and safety management systems. Even though it's called a health and safety management system, most of these systems are really 
safety focused, right? So how can we start now that we're we're opening up this uh, can a little bit and we're we're talking about um, wellness, the effect of diversity and inclusion uh, on safety in the workplace. How can companies start looking to build these into their safety management systems or their integrated management systems? I think these are all um, questions that we're gonna we're gonna have to start trying to help help uh, find some solutions to. And um, yeah, I think the the society is well positioned to to help organizations with that and other members. Yeah, there's those those three prongs, right? Like the physical safety, the physical health, that often gets you know subordinated to the safety piece, and then this yeah. the mental health and safety pieces, right? There's there's both aspects of that as well. And I from experience over the last two or three years, every miner I've talked to, doesn't matter what country they're from or or where they're coming from walk of life they're coming from they're they're talking about making sure that they've got a safe psychologically safe place to speak up right that's one of the biggest things and so how do you create that environment and you know the simple answer is well you get supervisors that do that well how, how do you do that right so hence we're back to the training and and uh programming that these companies put in place and the that we put in place in our systems so well i i guess from that perspective you mentioned the the convention we talked about sam you brought up the the next year's um, conference, safety conference, health and safety conference in October. Uh, and there's already a couple of questions here that we'll we'll get to later, but um, we're gonna go back to the audience here and, and do a quick poll uh, because now we're gonna start talking about a little bit about, you know, we've talked about all these great initiatives, but we need people to do that. So part of this is a plug to get you folks online and anybody listening in the future. Um, interested in actually signing up and clicking the buttons. So how could CIM and the Health and Safety Society make it easier to become a member? That's a question for you folks on the phone right now. We're already about 50% voted. Okay, give it a couple more seconds there, Michelle, and then we'll call it. Thank you. Let's see those results. Engaging outreach and promotion. So more promotional activities. It's great. Um, followed by what what what's the clear value hook, right? So that's the that's the two largest ones. Streamline on online registration. Maybe we can speak to that. I don't know who wants to take this one to to kick it off. Sam, Brian. Any thoughts on what you're seeing there? Um, yeah, sure. I, I I know actually. I think at the end of this um, session, we're going to have um, a link uh, available for for people to jot down there to be able to get the online registration. But also, um, you know, right from the CIM homepage, you you can get into the societies and and sign up. And if if all else fails, reach out to one of us. I mean, <laughs> we're we're pretty accessible people. Hit us up on LinkedIn. We've got a LinkedIn. Uh, page for the society. Anyone, um, you know, from the executive that's, um, we've all got access to that. So if you're interested in becoming a member, just drop, drop a message on there and one of us will, will reach out and walk you through the process. Um, yeah, lots of ways to do it. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in too on the value proposition. I, I, you know, I really don't think there's anywhere else um, other than this health and safety society where you would get this um, pulling together of, of um, safe health and safety advocates professionals um, working on this for for the industry and so it's it's I think CIM is a is a great value proposition and not only can you be part of health and safety there there's a number of other societies that you could also um, be part of you know I know myself I I joined CIM and I, I went right into rock engineering because that was my background and uh, you know as the years have gone on I'm like oh there's all these other societies I can be part of that you know I've learned from over the year so I would say you know that this is a this is a unique opportunity there's nowhere else where you would you we would be able to get this to my knowledge guys maybe you can weigh on that as well but and and you know we're all working together towards um, improvement to the health and safety uh, as and, and making a positive impact to the industry so uh, if you're if uh, if you're looking to to do those types of things I think there the value is there 
Yeah, not not to sound uh, too overconfident, but I find you know when we talk about mining capital of the world, it's Canada, right? And you've got Canadians running mines all over the planet. Not to take anything away from any other country, but we've got in my travels, it's always it always comes back to folks referring to what's in the o Occupational Health and Safety Act when it comes to how you run around a mine and there's other flavors on that, obviously, and and I'm not saying one's better than the other, but we've definitely got a got a standard here, right? And you talk about how CIM helped with NI43-101. That's that's mm -hmm. part of what we want to do with the HSS as well, right? Is create that kind of standard um, and lots of opportunity there. So with that opportunity, what does 2024 look like, and maybe even beyond too, in your minds? Um, so if I'm a member of the HSS or if I sign up today or in the next year or so after we hit the drive at the at the convention, what what does that look like? Samantha, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, sure. So I mean the the obvious are are the conferences, right? So you have the ability to come to the CIM conference in Vancouver. Uh, uh, the the Mind Connect is, as Brian said, is rebranded. It, in in May, uh, we'll have the Health and Safety Technical Stream. We're actually looking for people to put in abstracts for presentations at that conference. So if you're interested in that, please, you know, uh, send your abstracts in. And we're also looking for co-chairs. We're looking for people to to run those sessions. And so if you're interested in that, um, please send your your name in because yeah, that's uh, that's going to be um, that's going to be uh, relevant. It's going to be uh, really uh, topical conversations for for uh, all the all the presenters and and uh, audience there. Um, we have also at that <laughs> in that event we have our annual general meeting for this health and safety society, and we're looking for new members on our executive. So if you would like to be nominated and or elected, uh, that would happen in May. And so again, keep that on your radar and and see if you would uh, like to to join us and help move the society uh, and all the work that we do further. And then the health and safety conference is just health and safety now on October the 6th to the 8th in Toronto at the Marriott. Um, it is our inaugural conference in health and safety and it is going to be amazing. Two days solid work of, you know, what's working today and then what in the future are, uh, do we need to do for, for health and safety. A lot of um, breakouts and a lot of good conversations, panelists on that one and some very senior people um, as well all the way down to the face. So um, I, I think that would be a good one for people to attend uh, this next year. Uh, and maybe I'll just pause there. Brian, do you want to talk about some of the other the other things that we're doing? Yeah, sure. And maybe I'll start off like, um, you know, Nelson, your question of, you know, if, if I become a member, what does it look like? And my my experience with CIM started, I forget if it was 2018 or 2019, but it was in Montreal. Um, I'd gotten a talk, uh, accepted um, in the health and safety stream, but I just, you know, I knew it was a conference. I when I got to the conference, I didn't realize this, but like I said at the start, we have three days of programming. And so as a, a health and safety professional that works in mining, it was a really unique experience for me. Um, you know, I was able to get three days of courses and learning all in health and safety dedicated to mining. You know, there's lots of safety conferences that I can go to and get very little you know, mining content. There's lots of mining conferences to choose from, but get very little health and safety content. So to get that all, it just kind of really made me want to get involved. And then once once I got involved, it was it's it's pretty amazing. Like the the network of people that are that are part of our executive, that are part of the society outside of the executive, the volunteers that we have coming together. It's a really diverse group of professionals, some health and safety, some engineering, some scientists, but it's all people who are passionate about health and safety and wanting to make their workplaces better. So I think if you if you look at becoming a member and you know some of this resonates with you, I think you'll be um, you know I think you'll be pretty excited with your decision and and uh, the people that you'll get to interact and learn with like uh, Gord Winkle, you know, last year when he gave his uh, his safety wrap, I mean that that was a, a thing of brilliance at convention there. Um, for those of you that might have been there and saw it, but the the just the the characters, the personalities, and and the knowledge that um, you can tap into 
you can take that back to your workplace and, and really make a difference, um, not just for your workplace, but also to help um, you know, your own career and your own development as, as a professional in that workplace. So um, yeah, I think you know, becoming a member, coming out to the conferences that we're putting together, joining webinars like this, um, reading the newsletter, checking out the LinkedIn page. There's just a, a real great networking opportunity and opportunity to, to learn from other like-minded individuals. Yeah, and I so I'll speak to that. I'll sum that up. And my experience has been you get what you put, you get out of it what you put into it, right? Um, and there's no better way of uh, by learning or learning something if you just if you're doing it, if you're out there taking part in it. So we're always looking for folks on that. On um, you know we're looking to grow our membership, obviously. Talk about that in a little bit of a, mo a little bit of a moment. And uh, I really like the. Um, so far, what I like is the common thread for safety it covers everything, right? It always touches every piece of the work from all the way to the rock face, all the way to, you know, in my case, the Dory bar that's going out the door or the cathode or whatever product, finished product that you're sending off to the next stage. Um, it literally touches everybody. So it's, it's, a, it's a great, great opportunity to get involved in the business and learn a lot more. And Michelle, or um, Michelle, we're going to pull up that slide in a moment, but before we do, um, Samantha, are there? I think I think you might have mentioned this, but I and I don't know if I should be mentioned, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, but I, I've heard that we're in talks with Mark Kudafani to have him as like a as like one of the main speakers at the health and safety um, conference in October, right? Is that a, I don't yeah. want to let the cat out of the bag there, but. <laughs> It, it, it's all good, Nelson. And um, yes, we are super thrilled that Mark is going to be our honorary chair. He's he's going to give a, a keynote uh, on day one at the conference in October. You don't want to miss Mark. Um, if you've never met him, um, he will change your life. He's changed my life in 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 really great ways. So just one of those, I don't know, and you know how best to describe Mark. He's just a. a He's not only charismatic, but he's very intelligent, and he's just able to connect dots for people. And um, anyway, I think you're, yeah, people will be really excited to see Mark um, in that role and and help us throughout the two-day conference and in, in pulling and connecting pieces together. I mean, that's his yeah. that's his uh, his skill set, um, Nelson. Yeah, we're we're super thrilled to have him. Well, and my understanding is before he retired from Anglo, <laughs> leading Anglo, yeah. and and now he's with Valley Base Metals, but. Before he retired, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the folks that I worked for and have come up under in the industry that I consider mentors, personal mentors, consider him their mentor, right? And so, yes. a huge value add there, and and uh, some of the other names that you folks have brought up on the call today that are that have been around the industry for a while. That's just such a depth of knowledge. So you get involved, you get exposure, you get some face time, and you learn a ton, right? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well. Before we move on to closing remarks, Michelle, can you just bring up that that slide that we had with the QR code? There we go. So if you are on the call and if you are looking at your screen um, or you can see your screen, if you have a phone handy, you can scan that code. And, and of course, this will be recorded and posted to YouTube later and you can scan that code and that'll bring you to the sign up page. And there's a little check mark, I think, that you have to check off to make uh, the health and safety side of your preferred society. Um, and before we move on to kind of the wrap up question and get into the Q&A portion, uh, Samantha, any any um, kind of plugs for how people should sign up or where we're at with membership today? Um, and the plug is uh, please do <laughs> and yeah. and and help us make a difference. I really, I mean, we 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 uh, we need people like you said, Nelson. We need people who have ideas and thoughts uh, to join our our society and help us help us do you know some of this lifting together and and getting us to a different place. Bring different ideas to the table. Um, share other other thoughts on what we should be doing uh, as a society. Um, you know, I, I I going back to NI forty three one hundred one. And writing uh, a guideline for that, CIM has done that and issued and published it. And working on one right now for cost estimation for mineral projects. We're working on a guideline. It'll probably come out at the end of 2024. But it, you know, it's 
a device, diverse group were, were working on that. I'm thinking, why wouldn't we do that for health and safety? You know, have a guideline for uh, the best practices or leading practices in health and safety in, in mining and, and have a, a group of volunteers from, from this society, members here that are on the call, uh, helping us to pull that together. So, I, you know, I think those, you know, that type of stuff would be um, of interest to people. I know people want to give back to the industry, want to help us improve it and make it better. And so this is a, this is a great forum for doing that. And, um, and, and if you want to be on an executive, uh, we're also looking for people to work on our, our at the executive level and help us to bring some of these and champion some of these thoughts forward, like, like you have done with the, with the webinars, Nelson. So, yeah. Great. Uh, Brian, before I turn it back over to Sam for final thoughts, any any closing remarks from your end? Anything we missed today in the discussion so yeah, far? So maybe uh, just uh, tagging on to Sam's last comments there on membership. I think as a society, we're up to 250 or so members, um, 50 of which have selected the Health and Safety Society as their preferred society within CIM. So that's pretty good, but we got we've got lots. Um, of work to do there. Uh, a couple other points I just wanted to touch on as the uh, sponsorship, sponsorship uh, chair for the 2024 conference. Um, we're looking for sponsors uh, for our health and safety conference um, that's taking place October 6th to 8th in Toronto. Um, we've sent out an initial wave of um, invites. If, uh, if you're interested and you haven't seen one yet, please. Uh, please ping me, uh, reach out to me through through LinkedIn or through our, our page, um, and I'll get you the uh, sponsorship prospectus um, so your organization can consider uh, being involved in that. And then uh, just, you know, going back to, to the last thing on, on membership and call to action is just, you know, get involved. Um, this is, it's a, CIM is an amazing organization. Our Health and Safety Society is a great society. Um, you know, if, if you've got a, you know, if you're a little bit nervous or not sure how to start, just, just, just start. That, that's the key, you know, identify yourself and flag, say, yeah, I want to get involved. And, uh, I really don't think you'll regret it. I think you come out, um, you, you'll meet some great people and, um, yeah, just, just come and get involved. Yeah. It sounds like we're looking for folks from all around the industry, not just from a specific set of positions right so samantha i'll turn it over to you for final thoughts before we want to we've already got some q a pouring in here so we got about three four questions to cover but uh, any final yeah. thoughts as we close out the conversation on this yeah i think just the final thoughts um nelson I, you know are really four points um so if you want a value proposition and you want to jot it down and you want to take it to your boss and why you should be joining the cim health and safety society then these are them okay <laughs> you get access to a, a big network of global safety-minded individuals. And the thing to remember with CIM, we are also um, affiliated with other organizations like SME out of the US or OzIMM out of Australia, so even ICIMM. So you, you have access to that. Number two, you get to participate in leading best practices and in sharing knowledge on health and safety. And, you know, and that is huge and you can bring knowledge back to your own organization. Uh, number three, uh, that we recognize and we celebrate safety excellence, right? So companies that are JT Ryan Award winners or uh, Health and Safety uh, Leadership Awards, we get to celebrate that. So that's another thing <laughs> to keep in mind. And the fourth one is that you get to make a positive impact on the industry um, through through uh, your participation and through your leadership in health and safety. So that, you know, I think um, the, the value proposition is clear and uh, we really need you uh, to help us on this journey. Excellent. Well, thanks for that, folks. Before we uh, move into the closing of this webinar, we've got about well, three or four questions here. So I'll start with the, with the I think what the easy one is, is the, you know, why does CIM require members to pick a preferred society? Um, and as, as we mentioned earlier, you know, certain people have passions about integrated approaches to risk, so they, they might not prefer to be have one society. They might prefer to have several. Um, and so when they're, are they forced to pick one? Can they pick more? They're what not they, forced. What's the guidance there? On what they, <laughs> they can pick none if they want. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're not picky is the answer, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, but pick ours. You can choose multiple. Yes, you can. I have one preferred, but they, but they can they can select ten yeah. out of eleven societies if they like. Yeah, and there's no there's no change in how much a society gets funded based on membership. It's based on the overall attendance at the conference. So, um, you know, the, the short answer there, folks, is pick whatever you'd like or don't pick any at all. But we're always looking for folks to help out, and this kind of leads into the next. Um, the next question around the SIP database work. Um, so, so the question here, there's a little bit of a, a preamble, but the tricky part is getting to the root cause of the incidents before lawyers get involved. Uh, separately, many sites in the same companies and separated by a few kilometers have problems communicating incidents to their crews. So the question here is, how will the CIM execute the communication portion of this new tool? That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> Yeah, that, that one's a tough one, and uh, I think it goes back to uh, you know when we were first discussing this, Nelson. You, you mentioned we've been warned it's going to be like pushing a rope up a hill. Um, we know there's going to be challenges uh, to this, um, and I think uh, you know the more people we get involved and engaged in it, the better we'll be able to work through those challenges. We'll have the the numbers behind us to you know. You know, the more volunteers there are helping out, the the easier we'll be able to work through this. But we'll also get that diversity of thought um, with more volunteers helping us work on this um, to come up with novel ways to to break down these these silos that we've got that previously you know we haven't been able to do this. So I think um, you know I think the group's got a lot of good ideas and maybe Nelson, you're you're leading this. Why don't why don't you speak uh, yeah. to this? Uh, I know you're the, the interviewer here, but uh, Grenade, uh, well, this is so the, the current thinking now is, and we're having a meeting, the, the team that's uh, volunteered for us having another meeting on Friday. We usually meet about once every month or so right now to flesh out where we're going with this. I think there's going to be a three-pronged approach where you've got the CIM folks involved, you've got representatives from industry involved, um, and there's two flavors of that, right? There's the suppliers and the consultants that have all this this technical knowledge and on how to how to move the needle on all the theory side of things and you've got the the actual big players out there um, and then of course getting academia involved to get you know free to low cost volunteers working towards excuse me volunteers working towards the same kind of standard reporting model um, and I, I think it'll take some larger companies and Samantha you mentioned tech earlier I think they do a really good job of sharing the what happened and how did it happen. Uh, and I'm not so concerned from a timing perspective, like of course we want the data as, as much as possible, we want the correct data, right? Um, and so even if it goes through that filter, every company is gonna filter that to a degree, but it's it's not gonna be an easy task, but I think there's gonna be us setting the process, setting some standards and offering up the best practice process to identify the material and wanted events, identify, what those standards should look like from a fatal risk for underground, open pit, metal processing, what have you. And then also, how do you verify that the critical, the three to five critical controls are in place? Um, but I'll end there that without going into too much more detail. I think it's going to be a, a multifaceted approach with, with a lot of volunteer work. And hopefully, if we can get academia on board across each province and territory, wherever there's an institution, you know, there's a lot of programs out there right now for health and safety. There's a lot of different engineering and math programs. You know, there's lots of opportunity there. I think if we get creative and like you said, Brian, the more people we can get involved from a diverse, like a diverse thought perspective, we can get some really good ideas on the table. Um, so with the last six minutes that we have left, I've got two more for you folks. Uh, there's a comment here. But I regularly have to go to the U.S. stats to demonstrate and illustrate safety issues and strongly endorse the national reporting system, cannot address issues if we don't know the facts. So that's more of a comment, but can't agree more with that. Um, and then the other part, this was the original question that came in at about 125, about a half hour ago, and it was directed at uh, something you were mentioning, Samantha, about the stigma around companies and persons admitting fault, and that there could be an opportunity for, a, you know, to further the discussion, um, so, you know, quote unquote, to rip on the rip off the band-aid, so to speak. So any 
any insight on ways to overcome that stigma? I'll start with Samantha on that one. I think that was directed more towards your comment, so we'll start there. Yeah, I don't have the answer. I I I think just at least recognizing that. Oh yeah, that sometimes when when we we intend well, right, and when we try to put systems in place or incentives, you know, we really need to have safe production this month. You know, if we can have no recordable, everybody gets bonus, and and then things go underground, right? They they don't in in a, in a metaphorical sense. People don't come forward. They don't want to be the one. You know, we didn't get our bonus. So you ha we have to like think about um, those type of unintended consequences and how we can recreate systems and allow for that knowledge to come forward um, and celebrate it, honestly, like celebrate that and and use it to help us to be safer, right? And I think at the end of the day, it goes back to Mark Kudafen's point about being caring. So if you wanna, if you wanna somehow have caring as a foundation, then what systems can you build on it that allow for that to shine through, right? So I, th I think it's really just going back maybe even to like a systems design values, uh, values, you know, core values and, and helping to build systems that allow for disclosure, um, for um, sharing, transparency, and, and helping us as an industry to move forward in a caring way uh, so that we all go home safe at the end of the shift. Yeah. Brian, any last thoughts on that before we wrap up? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that covered it well, Nelson. Um, I, I don't have anything further to add there. That was good. Yeah, my, my short answer is going to be multi a couple of years before we get a lot of the companies if we get if we achieve our objective when we when we achieve our objective we'll, of a lot of the companies on board with this and there will be a certain level of of pride in actually sharing what happened um, and and uh, I know that sounds somewhat counterintuitive but I've seen it being done at some of the sites I've worked at and I work at and you know, people get into situations where they do like a safety share and it becomes a safety share, right? They don't necessarily talk about how, you know, Nelson made a mistake and did this wrong. It's, you know, he was, his mind was off task because he was tired and he was thinking about this and here's what happened. Here's the critical errors he made. How could we avoid that, right? And learn from that near miss. And, and so I think it starts there, but um, yeah, I a think lot of leadership. Right. I think you're right too. I think it's just like thinking about fail fast. Like in, in technology, you're like, oh yeah, we want to fail fast, we want to learn. But how can we bring that kind of thinking over into you know our operations and how we work? <laughs> so um, it is a bit of a conundrum, right? You 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 don't want to fail, but you do. You you kind of want to have safe failures, you know, if you know what I mean, and and yep. allow us to learn and and take that learning and make sure that the big events, like the big things, don't happen. Um, somehow creating that type of environment, it it, it it will take leadership for sure. If it, if it was easy, we would have solved it already as an industry, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I will thank. First off, I have a couple of things to thank as we wrap up the last two minutes here. Um, I'd like to thank CIM Magazine for their support this year, and specifically to a woman on, that just came back on the screen, Michelle Beacom, for our producer. She's been our producer, and she's my taskmaster whenever it comes to getting the deliverables in on time for this. Really, really thank for, thankful for you and your effort, Michelle, this year. It's been uh, it's been quite a quite an experience, and. I think next year we're going to get a couple of other guest hosts involved now that we've grown the society out a bit. Um, and so we'll, we'll have some other faces on the screen and we'll get some fresh perspectives up here as we move into 2024. Um, and I'd like to also thank our guest speakers today and throughout the year we've had a, a whole diverse set of folks on the call from people that work at the face to people that are in the service side of the business to people that lead or used to lead large portions of mining companies and, and how they look at at risk and safety and well, health and safety from risk and hazard perspective. Um, so, and of course to Brian and Samantha today for your time and, and talking specifically about, like the folks said, 57% of the folks said in more engaging outreach and promotion. So I think this checks off both of those boxes. Hopefully it does in the future as well with the recording. Um, and, and really to remember, like I, I, this might sound a little cliche or dramatic, but the content we're producing and everything we do at the CIM Health and Safety Society, I believe, is at least giving somebody some insight or some information if they're new to a role in the industry uh, on a way to prevent an injury or save a life. So I think it's pretty important work from that perspective. Um, you know, it's a little bit further away from the face, but but I think it's nonetheless value add. So 
that's why I've been involved in it and I love doing it. Um, so yeah, so for now, I guess we'll, we'll turn it over to Michelle to close up and thanks for everybody for attending today. Thanks, Nelson. And thank you, Samantha and Brian for participating today. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and ask that you please fill out the short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. A link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a link to register for the next episode of the Safety Share on February 15th. We will kick, kick off season two and 2024 with new guest speakers from across the industry to discuss the latest in how mining companies can improve health and safety performance across our industry. We hope to see you there and we wish everyone a safe and happy holidays. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.